Review time. This is a Cree LED light bulb, a 75 watt equivalency. They claim it draws 11.2 watts and generates 1,130 lumens. This uh, is the third generation of A-shaped bulb that I've torn down from Cree. They uh, started out with a bulb which had a glass envelope on the outside and a uh, metalized uh, filament tower, they called it, on the inside. Then they moved to having uh, two fiberglass circuit boards connected at right angles. And they punched holes through the envelope of the bulb to uh, create some airflow. They called that the four-flow bulb. And now I can see that they've uh, changed the uh, topology again to this bulb. I suspect this is actually probably the end point for most all A-shaped bulbs. Uh, almost all the vendors seem to be converging on uh, this style. Uh, as always, uh, let's uh, tear it apart, see how it's built, and then uh, also do some performance measurements. Okay, plastic dome, I sawed it off, obviously. And uh, looking below, we can see the emitter array, this uh, board down here. You can see there's a little plastic uh, piece. I presume it's trying to create some sort of directionality to the light, trying to push some of it uh, onto the side here so it uh, acts less like a spotlight. Problem with this structure here is that all the LEDs are basically firing downwards, so it, it's hard to create light on the side. And uh, this is sort of becoming the default uh, standard topology for an A-shaped bulb. Let's uh, keep on going and uh, keep tearing this down. Okay, there were two screws here and I took them out and uh, the assembly actually now slides apart, which is kind of interesting. We have a power supply here. The black goop is a potting compound. So we'll take that off in a second, but let's just uh, look at this assembly first. This is metal here, and um, I suspect it's going to be metal here. I'll pry it off in a second, but that's kind of good from a thermal management viewpoint. The idea of these LEDs heat up this piece of metal here, then it flows onto this body here, and they can be rejected into the environment. Let's see if we can pry up this emitter array. Sure enough. It looks like, yes, indeed. It's a metal-based uh, substrate, so that's very good quality, actually. It keeps the LEDs nice and cool. Some vendors, as the uh, prices have to be driven even lower, have now resorted to using uh, fiberglass circuit boards, which are not as good. Uh, the white goop, of course, is a thermal compound trying to create a nice thermal transfer from here to the metalwork. You can see it was very poorly applied. It really should be nice and smooth all around, uh, and it's, it's applied with a pretty heavy hand. Uh, generally speaking, you'd want a, a much thinner coat. Uh, however, of course, uh, this is being produced for economy, so uh, you'll see some carelessness here. Let's just uh, clean off this uh, thermal compound and see if we can find some markings in the circuit board. It's all white solder mask on the top, so there's no indication as to who's made this circuit board. Uh, and there looks like there's a bit of uh, information here. There's some text which has obviously been handled uh, by a machine. It's been sort of uh, ink printed. Uh, probably gives some traceability to the vendor as to what the circuit board is. Uh, no markings yet that this is uh, a Cree design, uh, just um, some generic tech. So looks like we need to uh, keep on going here and pull this one apart. Okay, uh, saw the uh, two portions apart and having pulled the assembly uh, apart. And what we can see is a very typical uh, construction. This uh, black material is called potting compound. It has a couple uses. Uh, it uh, dampens the sound that components might make uh, capacitors and uh, small inductors can whine a bit and uh, that helps dampen that sound. Uh, it's also helpful for a thermal transfer allows the heat to be more evenly distributed among the components which helps with service life so uh, you see this actually in better quality bulbs. Let's uh, take this goop off and look at the circuit board. Okay well here's the circuit board. Uh, first confirmation it is a Cree design uh, copyright 2016. Not sure if they're designing them in America still or not but uh, it looks like they're not just buying something off the shelf and re-badging it. A classic components, this is a inductor, this capacitor here that's used to reduce the chance of EMI noise being conducted back into the line. This uh, smoothing capacitor here uh, is a 105 degree rating. They're certainly better at 130 degrees, uh, so not as cheap as they're down at 85 degree, but uh, certainly not the best uh, capacitor in terms of uh, temperature performance. Just turning it over, we see a full wave rectifier here. There's a fuse for safety regulations that are required in Americas. Uh, two integrated circuits, a little small one down here, and one here it looks like a fairly significant uh, power transistor of some sort. So it looks like a fairly regular topology. Let's um, take these and acid de encapsulate them, see if we can see what the die photograph looks like. Uh, this large yellow component uh, looks like a transformer, but it's marked L1, and there's only three leads coming out of it, so I think it's actually. Um, an auto transformer, which would imply this is probably not an isolated design. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, silicon dies on this assembly. Uh, there was Q1, which is a transistor marking, and sure enough, we pop up the die photograph, a power transistor, quite classic looking. Uh, the other one, marked U1, however, uh, is actually much more interesting. Let's pop up its photograph. This is a uh, clearly a much more sophisticated integrated circuit, and it's actually marked Cree. So 
looks like Cree's actually got into the game of designing their own custom silicon, which I don't think I've seen before. So it shows a real strength. Cree's uh, been into this um, industry for quite some time, and they've got quite a bit of depth on it. So uh, there we go. Those are the two bits of silicon. Uh, as always, if you want to take a look at them in detail, I'll throw a copy up on electronupdate.blogspot.com. Okay, light distribution patterns. This is a light meter, and I use it to measure the output of the bulb uh, in 10 degree increments around this axis here. And that allows me to construct a polar graph. Uh, this is the center point here. The distance from the center point, the line determines the intensity. The larger the distance, the greater the intensity. This bulb basically is a, a downward firing bulb. Most of the light's going downward this direction here. Uh, not too much being pushed back here. The uh, bulb also has some asymmetry on it. So if I was to look at and graph it in this direction here, I suspect what I'd find would be some lobes because you can see this side was greater than that side there. I expect if I rotated it, that would change. Now, this is actually quite a bit different than the uh, Cree 4 flow, for example, and the bulb before it. Uh, both those bulbs actually made a significant attempt to uh, create a um, bulb that actually really emulated the old A-shaped bulb. This is the uh, Cree 4 flow. It took it about three years ago. And you can see here there was actually significant side lobes coming down here. So the bulb was trying to fire out uh, on the side, which is what incandescence used to do when the filament was vertically placed. So. Uh, this is really typical, though, I suspect, that the construction of the bulb has been simplified, uh, lowering costs, because that's really the tremendous important part of consumer bulbs. Uh, consumers simply don't want to pay for much of anything other than cost. So, uh, so what we get is a bulb which fires mostly downwards. So uh, this won't perform as well as it would in a, a lampshade where you kind of want the light to go this way, hit the lampshade, and then illuminate the room. So you kind of get this spot-like approach. Um, this isn't unique to Korea as cost gets reduced, uh, basically you start to get these limitations because, you know, the average customer doesn't have a clue what this is and uh, they can only see the price tag. Okay, power consumption. This is a watt-hour meter and it's measuring 11.6 uh, watts, 11.7 watts. The packaging claimed 11.2 uh, watts, so my meter is uh, reading higher than that. If I check the power factor, clearly almost unity, so there's probably power factor correct correction. Uh, while I'm here, of course, want me to just recheck flicker. We can see with the camera Ah, uh, yeah, so you can see these bands being formed, and that's a good uh, sense that there's some flicker on the bulb. Okay, flicker test. Um, here's a light bulb, and it's, of course, shining upon a solar cell. Uh, and that covers light to electricity. If we go to the oscilloscope view, you can sort of see the uh, output here of the solar cell with a little bit of uh, fuzz on the top, and that's basically flicker. If you want to take a better view of it, what you have to do is uh, couple your scope uh, AC and then uh, crank up the volts per division, and you can get some sense as to the uh, signal. And it's sort of a classic 60 hertz pattern. So uh, the bulb certainly uh, does demonstrate some flicker. It's uh, certainly not significant, but uh, yeah, it is present. Uh, so of course, if you're wondering why in the world I'm tearing down LED light bulbs, this all started about four or five years ago when I started a study on uh, looking at the cost reduction of LEDs as they uh, matured through the marketplace. Had a good uh, theory that, of course, they would drive to the lowest possible cost. And uh, sure enough, of course, here we see that where they are uh, starting to compromise the light quality directionality. Uh, of course, to drive a lower assembly cost. And this isn't unique. Cree's uh, behaving just as uh, all their competitors are. And this uh, end point of what an A-shaped LED light bulb uh, finally started to look like. 